Okay. So question seven. We spend a lot of time and training on the obstacles to the target condition. Help me understand the coaching philosophy behind the way we emphasize obstacles within the Baptist management system. You gotta take that one. Okay, <laughs> I'll take that one. For the last year and a half, maybe two years, I've bounced things off of Beth at, at different times. What I've noticed is coming right out of initial training, people are vague. They're vague with obstacles and, they're, and they, they don't know how to describe the current condition. They don't know enough about their current condition yet. And so as they start to be coached on how they're riding them, and what's the negative impact? Why can't we work in that target pattern? What's keeping us from being able to work in that tar target pattern? You actually start to outline what you do know. I know this fact, I know this piece of information, but it's keeping me from consistently doing this target pattern. What's the negative impact? And so there's just something I've noticed mm -hmm. that as someone works out their thinking and, and has to write out a more extended obstacle, not only that, but how they measure it, how can you measure that obstacle? How often does it happen? And what's, to what degree mm -hmm. is, it, is it hurting us as far as pain-wise? Uh, there's just something about that thought process that leads you toward the next logical step, as opposed to what we traditionally do, which is we get around the room, we brainstorm some ideas, and, and we might try five things, but we haven't really dug into a true obstacle. And I always say that the best learners are the ones that understand as Beth said, they're PDCAing against the obstacle, but they're out there trying to find additional obstacles. They understand that they only know a little mm -hmm. bit about the process, and I'm trying to find a little bit deeper, and what's that obstacle underneath that's causing that? So that's why I focused on really writing those out and getting that thinking process going. That's great. And that it, is really good. And it prevents people from writing, um, vague, again, these vague obstacles that are actually more resultant than an obstacle. So I, I take, the, what's one, I, an example, time. Oftentimes you see time written on, a, on someone's storyboard as an obstacle. Well, time is just time. It's not an obstacle, right? It might be priority. It might be the length of time something takes to be performed. There's something, time is just a, a resultant, right? right? And it's not anything we can experiment to overcome. Uh, so by being more precise and clear on your obstacles, you can see those kinds of vague obstacle statements um, go away. That's great. Yeah, I recently made a video, and hopefully that video will be helpful also to folks. One of the things we yeah. focused on that video was, how, again, how you measure that obstacle. Mm -hmm. and, and can you translate that if it's happening on a regular basis? Maybe that is a process metric we need to be measuring each day. And maybe we need to be trending how often that happens. So many times when we decide how we're going to measure it, we pull that into the process metrics, which again relates back to the target working pattern. That's great. That's really good. Question number eight. The PDSA form we use is similar to others used by CADA practitioners, but we have some distinct parts to the four boxes or types of PDSA experiments. Can you tell us why it is important that the coach or second coach recognizes the details within the four boxes of the PDSA? Sure, I'll take the, one, the first one there is the step and the obstacle that you're working on. One of the things we've added is uh, the type of experiment, and that's throughout Mike Rother's handbook, his guidebooks and everything, is the, the simplest form is go and see. Uh, then the next step up from that is we're going to change something about the process. We're unsure what's going to happen, but we've got a hunch that maybe this will result in, in, in overcoming the obstacle. And then after you've maybe done several of those, you move into a testing of a hypothesis. I think if I change one thing about it, then I'll always get this result. When you have the learner actually identify what type they're in, you, the coaches can quickly see when, when a learner is stuck in a go and see mode or a go and do mode, and they're not actually changing to that working pattern mm -hmm. that Beth was talking about. So that's one of the things we have in that first box. The second part of that is uh, the expectation. We want them to at least make a prediction. And, and by making a prediction, they're at least identifying that this step is related to this obstacle, and I predict that I will overcome it if we you know, can do this step. Mm -hmm. And I also tell a lot of uh, coaches is, uh, it's okay if an experiment fails, that's fine, we're gonna learn from it. It's not okay to leave that coaching cycle and you haven't mm -hmm. fully evaluated the step. 
what could cause it to go off rail. So I'll see a lot of steps repeated sometimes mm -hmm. because we didn't really evaluate the, the logic around the step, you know, what could cause it to, to go off the rails, so to speak. So what I like to see as it relates to that, those two blocks, the, the first one is what's your next step, experiment, and what do you expect, and we talk about things, what do we expect to happen, so that's that prediction, and to learn, to and learn. With, a, with that statement, I like to see those two connected. It's kind of like, here's my change, here's my prediction, and there's an underlying hypothesis that links the two. And, and, a, and a coach should be able to pull that thought pattern out of the learner um, to make it a really effective experiment. And then the, the last two boxes are, you know, once, once the coaching cycle is done, the coach releases the learner to do the experiment, and the learner has to observe deeply and then compare mm -hmm. or, uh, or study <laughs> what actually happened versus their expectation, and that's that moment of learning, which is the fourth box. Right. We right. always say that's the most critical box of any on mm -hmm. a Kata storyboard. Yeah. What did we learn from taking that stuff? And one thing I would add, the coaches, a lot of times the, the, the more competent, proficient coaches will understand when a learner has put the facts and data into what happened, and then they've kind of loosely <laughs> translated the facts and data again into what they learned. Maybe they were made aware of something they didn't know. Well, technically, yes, I did learn that. I was made aware of it. I didn't know that it was happening. But we really want that, what did you learn to be? Reflect on the facts and data and tell me now what's your next thought process? What's your next thinking pattern? How did what's that your, influence your how thinking? How did that influence my thinking? And, and it's more of a reflection. I almost want to put above what did you learn, reflect on what happened and tell me what you learned.